Hi, I'm Jennifer Thomas. I'm co-director of the Center for Behavioral Teratology at San Diego State University. And it's a real pleasure to be speaking with you today. I'm sure that if you're going through the entire RSA lecture series, you've learned a lot about alcohol's effects on the adult, maybe even the adolescent. I'm gonna be talking about alcohol's effects on the developing fetus. In other words, what happens when there's prenatal alcohol exposure? Because prenatal alcohol exposure is a serious issue, in large part because a majority of women of childbearing age drink alcohol. In fact, a fair number may be alcohol dependent or binge drinking, which may be particularly risky if they're pregnant. And unfortunately, there's a lot of misinformation out there. So despite best step prevention efforts, despite public health announcements, warning labels, many women continue to drink alcohol during pregnancy. Moreover, when you consider that over almost 50% of pregnancies are unplanned, many women may be drinking even heavily before they recognize that they're pregnant. And that early exposure can still have adverse effects on the developing fetus. So prenatal alcohol exposure is a serious public health concern. So what do we know about the consequences? Well, it was in the late 60s that physicians described a constellation of symptoms in children born to alcoholic women. And a few years later, in 1973, the Ken Jones and David Smith described similar symptoms and coined the term fetal alcohol syndrome. To be diagnosed with fetal alcohol syndrome, there are three criteria. There's a specific pattern of facial features or dysmorphia, evidence of pre and postnatal growth deficiencies, and then finally, some evidence of central nervous system dysfunction. And it's now been recognized that when we think about fetal alcohol syndrome, it's really just the tip of the iceberg and that many individuals are exposed to alcohol prenatally, may suffer from some of the consequences of it, but not meet the diagnostic criteria of the fetal alcohol syndrome. These individuals may be diagnosed with partial FAS, alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorders, alcohol-related birth defects. Collectively, this range of outcomes associated with prenatal alcohol exposure are referred to as fetal alcohol spectrum disorders or FASD. And unfortunately, FASDs do not discriminate. They affect all races and ethnicities. So FASDs really do constitute a global public health problem. In terms of prevalence, Prevalence rate estimates really vary across the globe from country and depending upon country and drinking culture. There was a recent study conducted here in the US by the Collaboration on Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorders where they examined first graders in four US regions and they estimated that somewhere between six to nine per 1,000 live births is affected with FAS and somewhere between one and 5% of individuals is affected with FASD. Moreover, they suggested that these estimates are very conservative and may actually underestimate the true prevalence. So that would mean that fetal alcohol spectrum disorders are more prevalent than autism spectrum disorders, but they don't get the same amount of attention in part because there's a lot of stigma associated with FAS, a problem and a challenge that we're still facing today. So what do we know of these consequences? Let's take a look, closer look, starting with the facial features of fetal alcohol syndrome. Here you can see some of the major features, including a flattened midface, an indistinct philtrum, which is this area between the nose and the upper lip. It's kind of flattened, you know, it doesn't exhibit that cupid's bow, a thin upper lip, and short pupil fissures or small eye openings. And there's a whole host of other minor features as well. Interestingly, you can generate these same facial features using a mouse model and a single day of alcohol exposure on gestational day seven. This is a period of development roughly equivalent to the third week of gestation in humans. So you can see here, this is a face of a mouse embryo, a control mouse. You can see the mouth, the nose, the eyes. And this is the face of a mouse embryo that has been exposed to heavy amounts of alcohol on gestational day seven. And you can see some of these classic features like a flattened mid face, this indistinct, 
philtrum or flattened philtrum and small eye openings. Now, of course, the face tells us that there's been some exposure, but we're really interested not so much in the face, but what's happening behind the face, what's happening in the brain. And interestingly, the single day of heavy alcohol exposure on gestational disease seven in the mouse can produce neuropathology, particularly in brain structures along the midline. And in fact, if we look at brain development, this is where a lot of attention has been paid in the last few decades in terms of looking at prenatal alcohol exposure effects. What does this do to the brain development? And there actually are many different brain areas that are affected by prenatal alcohol exposure. This is not an exhaustive list, just some of the areas that have been studied probably the most, including the cerebellum, various cortical areas, subcortical structures like the basal ganglia, the hippocampus. In addition to there being changes in brain structures, there also are alterations in white matter tracts like the corpus callosum. And I'll go into this in greater detail in just a moment. For example, if you look at the cortex, you see that there are all these bumps and folds. This, these folds are called gyri, so this is called gyrification of the cortex. It's a folding of the cortex so that you can actually get more cortical tissue inside your cranium. And this is what you see with typical development, but there's actually abnormal folding or gyrification in, in some individuals with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. In addition, if you look closely at the cortex, there are some areas where the cortex is thinner and other areas where the cortex is thicker compared to age match controls. Either of these changes may be reflective of neuropathology. During development, not only do you have progressive events, are generated, established connections, you also have, just importantly, regressive events where there's a loss of cells and a pruning of those connections so that you have a more refined and functional cell network within the cortex. So either thickening or thinning of the cortic cortical regions can reflect neuropathology. This next picture just shows kind of an extreme example of structural abnormalities in fetal alcohol syndrome. And again, I want to point out that it's extreme because in many cases, you won't necessarily see such striking differences. But here you see a mid-sagittal view, an MRI of a 12-year-old male, typically developing. You can see the corpus callosum, the cerebellum, cortex, brainstem, and even some subcortical structures. And here you can see that same mid-sagittal view in an age match individual with fetal alcohol syndrome. And you can visibly see the changes in the corpus callosum, which are smaller and displaced. You can see changes in the cerebellum, there's pathology there, but you can also see some abnormal gyrification in the cortex as well, and even alterations in the brainstem and subcortical structures. Now, in addition to structures, if we look at the corpus callosum, we see that the prenatal alcohol exposure alters white matter tracts. And this is beautifully illustrated in this tractography shown here by Jeff Wozniak. These are the fibers that are crossing from one hemisphere to another, connecting them through the corpus callosum. And on the right, in a 12-year-old male control subject, these fibers, compared to an age match individual with FASD. And you can visibly see that there's an alteration in the structure and even the number of fibers crossing the corpus callosum. So that means that the connections between the two hemispheres are not going to be optimally functioning. This is really nicely illustrated if we look at signal changes in structures in each hemisphere that are connected via the corpus callosum. So if we look in the medial orbital frontal cortex, in the left hemisphere is in blue, the right hemisphere is in red. And if you look at the signal change, you can see that there's a beautiful synchrony between the signal change in these two hemispheres in a control healthy individual. But you don't see that same synchrony, or you may not, in individuals with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. So again, it suggests that those connections are not operating efficiently. And that's what you need for a good processing of information. And in fact, our brain is actually designed to be efficient 
to maximize efficiency. So what this means is that early in development, when these connections are being laid down during pregnancy, the alcohol is disrupting that somehow. This is further illustrated when we look at functional connectivity, connections between different networks in the brain. And in this recent study, they looked at functional connectivity between a number of different networks, including the default network, networks involved in salience, attention, language, the frontal parietal area. And you can see that there's a reduction in the functional connectivity shown here in red compared to controls in blue in a number of these internetwork connections. And what's interesting is that the reduction in functional connectivity relates to performance on related to cognitive tasks, suggesting that these underlying deficits in functional network brain architecture may be related to cognitive impairments. And so given that there can be these kind of differences in functional connectivity, it's not surprising that there are many studies that have also shown differences in imaging. This is just one example showing functional imaging in children, either control or with FASD, during a working spatial memory task. And what's interesting about this study is that their task performance was the same, but their brain activity was not. The individuals with prenatal alcohol exposure had more brain activity in their frontal cortex, an area that we know is important for executive functioning, which I'll talk about in just a minute, in order to basically get an equivalent level of performance on this task. So even if there aren't gross structural changes, there may be functional changes in the brain of individuals who've been exposed to alcohol prenatally. And that's really what's important. Not only is the functioning in the brain important, but how does this express then as changes in behavior? It's not surprising that prenatal alcohol exposure can lead to a general deficit in intellectual ability, as shown here with IQ score. Controls are shown in yellow. Individuals with fetal alcohol syndrome are shown in red. And you can see a significant reduction in their IQ full scale, verbal and procedural. What was interesting about this early study is that they also looked at individuals with heavy prenatal alcohol exposure who did not meet the diagnostic criteria for FAS. Shown here in purple, they also exhibit deficits in intellectual ability. So prenatal alcohol exposure is a leaning known cause of intellectual disability in the Western world. But in addition to some overgeneralized intellectual deficits, there are many different behavioral domains that are impacted by prenatal alcohol exposure, including executive functioning, attention, learning and memory, mathematical skills, social processing, motor abilities, mood, sleep, and stress. For example, executive functioning depends upon the frontal cortex. This involves cognitive functionings involved in planning and guiding behavior to achieve a goal in an efficient manner. So it involves organization and planning, the ability to focus and maintain attention, to store and retrieve memories, and also to inhibit and regulate both emotions and behaviors. This is just one early example of executive functioning. In this task, there are discs that are placed on these pegs, and the goal is to get the discs in the following configuration with the following rules, that you can only move one disc at a time, and a larger disc cannot go on to a smaller disc. And if we look at the rule violations, you can see that individuals with fetal alcohol syndrome or just heavy prenatal alcohol exposure without diagnosis of FAS that violated more rules compared to controls. Another, just one example of executive functioning deficits. Attention is another domain that seems to be particularly impacted in individuals with FASD. In fact, more than 60% of children with FASD have problems with attention. This is going to affect their ability to regulate themselves. I want to point out, however, that even though there are higher rates of ADHD and hyperkinetic disorders in individuals with FASD, that in some cases, the nature of these attention deficits may be different. In particular, individuals with FASD may have more difficulty shifting attention, encoding information, and problem solving, whereas individuals with ADHD may have more difficulty focusing and sustaining attention. 
There also are challenges in learning and memory, both a verbal and nonverbal information, problems in learning, as well as recalling and recognizing information, particularly if there's a delay, particularly if there's a time period before they have to recall that information. And of course, if they have problems with executive functioning, attention, learning, and memory, it's not surprising that they also have problems with academic functioning. In fact, 70% have learning or attention problems in school, but most children with prenatal alcohol exposure are identified once they get into the school system. And there they may have difficulties, they may end up in special education classes, but I want to point out this graph over here showing academic function on a number of domains, including word reading, spelling, numerical operations, and mathematical reasoning. Because although you can see that there are some deficits in the individuals exposed to prenatal alcohol, there's particularly devastating effects in mathematical abilities. So mathematics represents one area where individuals with prenatal alcohol exposure may exhibit more severe deficits than in other areas. Individuals with prenatal alcohol exposure also can have problems with both gross and fine motor skills difficulty with hand-eye coordination, balance, gait, slowed motor speed and reaction time, and even poor force control in either isotonic or isometric conditions. And an individual with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder may exhibit problems with a number of behaviors, really exemplified by these behaviors from the child behavior checklist. This is a parent report looking at a number of domains, emotional, social attention problems. And you can see here, compared to controls shown in yellow, that individuals with prenatal alcohol exposure, whether they have fetal alcohol syndrome or not, exhibit a greater number of problems in a number of these domains. In fact, individuals with FSD are more likely to have psychiatric diagnoses, problems with delinquency, legal troubles, and an increased risk for substance abuse later on in life. Now, more recently, there's really been an interest in what are called adaptive behaviors. Adaptive behaviors are kind of those skill sets that are required to successfully navigate the world, the social world, and reduce conflict with others. This includes communication. So individuals with prenatal alcohol exposure may have difficulty acquiring language and difficulty with pragmatic language. Problems with independent living skills, and you can just imagine how this can be very challenging. They may have more problems or impairments with basic life skills. They may not be aware when their safety is being compromised, so they may not maintain personal safety, and they have difficulty organizing daily schedules. And then finally, social functioning. Individuals with prenatal alcohol exposure may be overly friendly with strangers. They may have difficulty reading social cues or understanding social consequences. So this can translate into problems with friendships and other kinds of social interactions. And you can see these adaptive behaviors, again, are really the skill sets that are necessary for navigating our social world. So these can actually be some of the most devastating in individuals with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. This, these next graphs just show these adaptive behaviors, communication, daily living skills, and socialization. Not only in FASD individuals, compared to controls, but individuals with ADHD in this panel or individuals with learning disabilities in this panel shown in purple. And you can see that particularly with daily living skills that individuals with FASD are more impaired in these adaptive behaviors compared to controls and ADHD, as well as individuals with other types of learning disabilities. And so more recently, there's been a new categorization, a diagnostic categorization in the DSM-5, referred to as neurobehavioral disorder associated with prenatal alcohol exposure, or NDPAE, which really capture a lot of these behaviors that I've been talking about. For this diagnosis, there has to be a history of more than minimal levels of that prenatal alcohol exposure. There has to be some evidence of neurocognitive impairment, of impairment in cerebral regulation, and deficits in at least two adaptive functioning skills. So this really captures the profile that I've been showing you. I also want to mention a couple of behavioral changes that have been more studied in animal models, but I think that are highly relevant. 
There's a large literature showing that prenatal alcohol exposure can disrupt stress systems. And I think this is important because dysregulation in stress systems can contribute to mood disorders and poor health outcomes. That's our stress. So these are some data with an animal model using a rat model. In Weinberg's lab, they've shown that rats that are exposed to alcohol prenatally have an increase in their stress hormone release. So this is cortisol, the stress hormone in rats following a stressor. And the control rats shown in blue, you can see there's a release of cortisol in response to the stressor that eventually returns to baseline. But this response is greater in individual rats that have been exposed to prenatal alcohol. Another interesting behavioral change that's been studied in animal models are changes in rhythms. We all live in a rhythmic environment and we have these circadian rhythms that help us to regulate and be in sync with the environmental cues. There's evidence from animal studies that these circadian rhythms, in fact, the brain areas involved in circadian rhythms may be directly impacted by prenatal alcohol exposure. These are some data from an animal study where animals were exposed to alcohol during development and then the light dark cycle phase was shifted. What you can see in blue are that the control animals were able to shift and adjust to this new light dark cycle more rapidly than subjects exposed to alcohol during development. I mention this because again, I think that this is an area that hasn't been studied that much, but we do know that if there's a disruption in rhythmicity, that this can contribute to mood disorders and it can also contribute to sleep disorders, which I haven't talked a lot about, but individuals with FASD is commonly reported that they have sleep problems as well from infancy all the way through adulthood. So we can see that there are a lot of different consequences of prenatal alcohol exposure. But what I wanna note is that most of these data at least from the clinical studies, have come from children with prenatal alcohol exposure. Of course, children with prenatal alcohol exposure or FASD become adults with FASD. And it's really only been recently that there's been a strong interest in understanding what are the long-term effects of this prenatal alcohol exposure? What happens to adults with FASD? And in large part, there's been an engine of adults with FASD, they're part of this adult leadership committee called the Change Makers, who have really motivated researchers to try to better understand what these long lasting effects are. For example, what are the long lasting effects on brain? Uh, we know that the trajectory of brain development is different in children who've been exposed to prenatal alcohol compared to controls, just shown in this one cortical region. But as we've seen in many cases, the data kind of drop off as soon as these individuals reach adulthood. What happens beyond that? Are the normal regressive events accelerated? Does the brain change in a parallel with, with control brains? There only are a couple of studies out there now starting to look at what happens in the brains of adults with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. But we've also started to recognize that we need to look beyond all events happening above the neck. The prenatal alcohol may affect a number of other health outcomes as well across the lifespan. This is consistent with the DOHAD concept, developmental origins of health and disease, that exposure of the fetus to a suboptimal environment causes adaptations that may in the short term help the fetus survive but then the long term leads to an increased vulnerability to developing diseases in adulthood. So there's accumulating evidence that prenatal alcohol exposure may affect long term health, immune function, as well as a whole host of other types of health issues. This has been demonstrated in a number of animal studies that have associated prenatal alcohol exposure with deficits in immune function, alterations in, in metabolism, metabolic alterations, greater risk for tumors and cancers, increases in blood pressure, and kidney abnormalities.
These are some recent data looking at individuals, um, adults with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. And you can see that there may be differences, although both males and females have a shorter stature compared to controls. In males, although these effects are not huge, um, more males with FASD are underweight compared to controls and more females with FASD are overweight or considered obese. So there may be metabolic change in individuals with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. In addition, in a survey that was conducted by adults with FASD, they reported a number of different health risks, increase in, in vulnerability to a number of different health conditions, including cardiovascular problems. For example, Individuals with prenatal alcohol exposure were more likely to report having a heart problem as a child, a tendency to have a heart problem as an adult, but a significant increase in high blood pressure as an adult. So when we think about these consequences of prenatal alcohol exposure, it's not just the cognitive behavioral neuropathological effects, but alcohol may be having broad effects on health overall. So where do we go from here? Well, when you break it down, there are two primary goals. One is prevention. How can we prevent prenatal alcohol exposure? And secondly, how can we intervene? How can we improve the outcome of those individuals who've already been exposed to alcohol prenatally? And there are a number of challenges to achieving these goals. One of them is simply identifying individuals with FASD because currently, there's not consensus among the different diagnostic criteria. But diagnosis is so important because it allows us to get services for individuals who are affected, and especially if we want to get services implemented early on. It helps us to better identify and create new treatments. And it can also help us to better inform the public of the consequences of drinking during pregnancy so that they understand the full range of possible outcomes. But it can be difficult because unlike some neurodevelopmental disorders where you may have a genetic marker, we don't necessarily have good indicators of maternal alcohol use. Typically, you rely on self-report, medical documentation, or family member reports. And in these cases, we don't necessarily have good information on exactly how much alcohol, when the alcohol exposure occurred, or what the drinking pattern was like. So what we need are biomarkers. Biomarkers provide physical evidence of alcohol exposure. Now we all know that we can measure alcohol in breath, blood, and urine, but these markers are only present for a short period of time. We really want markers that tell us what's happened in the previous nine months during pregnancy. And there are some markers that can be available in various biological tissues, including fatty acid ethyl esters that may serve to help us identify individuals who've been exposed to alcohol prenatally. Biomarkers might be detected in dry blood spots from the newborn, meconium, newborn hair, deciduous or baby teeth. Others are looking at biomarker patterns in placental proteins and microRNAs. Now it may not be all that surprising that biomarkers suggest that many women underreport their alcohol use during pregnancy. Here we can see phosphatidylethanol and dry blood spots from the newborn. And you can see that the indicators of maternal alcohol use are higher compared to those from self-report surveys. Now we want these biomarkers to be sensitive and to specific. We also want them to be able to identify an individual as early as possible and I want to point out that biomarkers may not only tell us about alcohol exposure, but we can also have biomarkers of outcome. Biomarkers indicate that there's some alcohol induced damage. And these can be just as valuable because they help us to predict those individuals who may be at highest risk. These are some data. These are cytokine data coming from blood of pregnant women during the second trimester. And these are different profiles of cytokines. Each column is a cytokine. Green indicates lower levels, red indicates higher levels. And we see very different patterns of cytokines depending upon maternal alcohol consumption as well as neural developmental outcome of the infant. So at the top, we see a pattern of cytokines when there's no alcohol exposure or little alcohol exposure during pregnancy. 
and typical neurodevelopments in the infant compared to when there's no alcohol exposure but neurodevelopmental delay in the infant. Here we have the pattern when there's been prenatal alcohol exposure, but typical neurodevelopment in the infant compared to prenatal alcohol exposure and neurodevelopmental delay. And so we might be able to look at these cytokine signatures to help predict which individuals may suffer from problems later on in life, as well as indicate whether or not there's been maternal alcohol consumption. But we still have other challenges. In part, there are only a limited number of individuals, clinicians, who are trained to identify fetal alcohol syndrome in the whole spectrum. In addition, we want to be able to identify individuals who really do represent that whole range of effects. Now, certainly we can start using telemedicine, as we've seen here during COVID. A lot of us are becoming familiar with that to help identify and to diagnose individuals from distance. But another strategy that's being explored by the collaborative initiative of FASD is 3D facial imaging. This is where you capture a 3D image of the face and the computer can generate an algorithm to detect those features that indicate prenatal alcohol exposure. And we've had come a long ways when you think about the technology where we started with these really big 3D cameras. And of course, now you can capture a 3D facial image with a handheld device or even a cell phone. And so you can capture a 3D facial image you can create a map and actually look at thousands of points on that face. You can also objectively provide measurements of various features and create heat maps where there are certain areas in the face that are inflated or deflated compared to age match controls. This is just an example. This is a frontal and profile view of a face being morphed between the features of FAS and control. And here's just a heat map of that facial signature. And in fact, you can create individual facial signatures using this computer algorithm. And the idea is that you can take these 3D images, analyze the face, and actually come up with a dysmorphology report for risk of prenatal alcohol exposure. Again, this is something that we hope to see eventually come on board. It's currently under development. Now, facial imaging could be useful, again, for telemedicine applications, also for rapid data acquisition, so you can identify novel features that distinguish groups, and hopefully you can detect features that may be rather subtle so that we can identify individuals along the full spectrum of FASD. But this idea that we can maybe use mobile health in order to improve diagnosis and screening is important because Mobile health has a possibility for scalability because most individuals have a smartphone. So information can be accessed anywhere, anytime, and it can also reduce barriers related to geography, stigma, and clinician availability. For example, Sarah Matson has identified a decision tree called the E-Tree to provide a risk score of prenatal alcohol exposure based on a limited number of physical and behavioral outcomes. She's also developing an online neuropsychological evaluation that can be used. So this would allow us to have apps that would be available to a lot broader uh, population and to reach individuals that otherwise would not be able to be seen by a clinician. Ultimately, we want to be able to identify individuals because we want to intervene as early as possible. So this leads to the next question, how can we intervene? What are the possible treatments? Well, when you think about what you can do to reduce the severity of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, there are a number of strategies you can take. One is to identify how alcohol is causing the damage and protect against that damage. You may also identify factors that modify alcohol stratogenic effects, these risk and resilience factors, and manipulate those. Or you can simply identify ways to enhance neural plasticity or function, again, even after there's been prenatal alcohol exposure and an alcohol insult. <laughs> 
So this first strategy is to identify the mechanism of damage and to block that. And I'm not going to go through the slide, but I just want to point out that alcohol is a messy drug. This is not an exhaustive list of all the mechanisms of damage, but alcohol has many mechanisms of damage. And animal studies have shown that in many cases, we can protect against some of alcohol's damaging effects on the developing fetus by blocking some of these mechanisms, by blocking some of these pathways. For example, one hypothesis was that ethanol causes some of the adverse effects by inhibiting what are called cell adhesion molecules, which do exactly what their name suggests. They cause the cells to stick together. And here you can see dissociated cells. These are cells that have been transfected with the L1 cell adhesion molecule. So they start sticking together. This is what you should see. When you add just a small amount of alcohol, the L1 cell adhesion molecule becomes dysfunctional and the cells start to break apart in a dose dependent manner. And in fact, you can protect against some of alcohol's teratogenic effects by blocking alcohol's actions on this L1 cell adhesion molecule. So this is a mouse embryo, a control mouse embryo. Here's a mouse embryo that's been exposed to heavy amounts of alcohol prenatally. And this is a prenatally alcohol exposed mouse embryo where the action of alcohol in the L1 cell adhesion molecule was blocked. And you can see it can have some protective effects. We now know exactly where alcohol binds to this L1 cell adhesion molecule. And so this could lead to the development of pharmacological treatments to prevent some of the damage caused by prenatal alcohol exposure. A second strategy is to identify factors that can modify vulnerability to FASD. One of these factors are nutritional factors. For example, we've known for decades with animal studies that poor nutrition exacerbates alcohol's damaging effects on the fetus, whereas good nutrition may be somewhat protective. And unfortunately, many women who are drinking heavily may have lower levels of nutrients that are essential for the development of the baby. But even if there isn't gross reduction in nutritional status, animal studies have shown that a number of different nutritional supplements may reduce risk for prenatal alcohol effects or FASD, including vitamins E and C, folate, zinc, iron, and choline, which I'll talk about in just a minute. So choline is an essential nutrient that's found in a variety of foods, including river and eggs. And we've been exploring how choline may protect against some of prenatal alcohol's effects when it's administered during the prenatal period using an animal model. And in fact, we have found with our animal model that we can protect against the number of physical and behavioral consequences of prenatal alcohol exposure with prenatal choline supplementation. So here are some data from a spatial working memory task where animals have to swim in this tank filled with opaque water and find a platform hidden under the surface using the extra many spatial cues. And in this particular study, we used the working memory version of the spatial learning task. Here you can see the path length to find the platform. So the greater the path length, the worse their performance. And subjects exposed to ethanol during development were impaired compared to controls unless they also received prenatal choline supplementation. But do these results translate to clinical populations? Well, there are two clinical studies of prenatal choline supplementation, one conducted by Joe and Sandra Jacobson and one by Tina Chambers. And the data to date suggests that, in fact, the animal data do translate to clinical populations. So here we're just looking at growth in infants that were born to women who were drinking during pregnancy. Again, this was a double blind placebo controlled study where women who were drinking during pregnancy received either choline or placebo. And at birth, there were no differences in birth weight. However, there were increases in weight and head circumference, both at six months and at 12 months after birth. In addition, they saw an improvement in the behavioral performance in infants who were exposed to alcohol prenatally. This is object recognition, a simple type of memory task. And in infants who were exposed to alcohol prenatally, their performance was worse compared to controls unless they received choline supplementation during the prenatal period. 
So these data are exciting because it suggests that simply improving maternal nutritional status might reduce risk for fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. But there's another problem. You may not necessarily have the opportunity to intervene during prenatal alcohol exposure. More likely, you're only able to intervene after birth, after the child's already been exposed to alcohol prenatally. Can nutritional factors still reduce FASD at this time point? Well, our data with choline supplementation suggests that they can. In fact, we can give choline supplementation postnatally after early alcohol exposure and see improvements on a number of behavioral tasks, including the spatial learning task, where you can see impairments in animals exposed to alcohol during development, but not if they receive choline supplementation. Open field activity, where you see hyperactivity in alcohol exposed subjects compared to controls, but not if they received choline supplementation postnatally. And even eye blink conditioning, here shown in red, are the animals exposed to alcohol during development, and they show very little learning compared to all other groups, including in blue, the subjects exposed to alcohol but receiving choline during the postnatal period. Do these results translate to clinical populations? Well, Jeff Wozniak has been conducting a double-blind placebo-controlled study giving choline supplementation to children who've been exposed to alcohol prenatally aged two to five. And at four years post-treatment, he's finding improvement on a number of cognitive skills. So here we have a number of different cognitive dimensions, performance on different cognitive tasks. In yellow are the children who were exposed to alcohol but received choline during this period when they were toddlers compared to placebo controls shown in red. And you can see improvements in nonverbal IQ, significant improvements, and in working memory. Again, consistent with what's seen with the animal models. So this leads us kind of to our last way in which we can improve or enhance performance in individuals who've been exposed to alcohol prenatally is to identify ways to enhance plasticity because we know experience can change the brain. So what do we know about other behavioral or environmental interventions? We can use what we know about typical brain development to help guide us. For example, we know that in typical brain development, the brain is plastic throughout the lifespan. And that many environmental factors or experiences can enhance this plasticity, like enriched environment, stimulation, exercise, whereas adverse experiences can impair plasticity. So stress can impair plasticity. We can go back two decades and see animal studies that show, in fact, that stress exacerbates the effects of prenatal alcohol exposure. So here's performance of animals that are exposed to alcohol prenatally and then tested later on in life in this spatial learning task. And you can see they're impaired compared to controls, but this is exacerbated if they also received early stress. Conversely, if we use some of these environmental experiences that may have positive effects on plasticity, we may see beneficial effects like exercise. These are data from an animal study. Again, animals were exposed to alcohol during development and later on tested on a spatial learning task. And you can see that the alcohol exposed subjects were impaired compared to controls, but the performance was improved if they also got exercise. And we see this improvement both in the animals exposed to alcohol during development as well as controls. So what does this mean for clinical application? Well, there are a number of clinical studies now using various types of training to enhance plasticity in children with prenatal alcohol exposure. Some have used exercise and motor skill training. And in fact, even exercise may improve things like executive functioning video games. This is a study that's been conducted by Claire Coles and Julie Cable, where they've looked at this GoFAR program, which is designed to enhance effective and cognitive functioning using computer games and experiential learning, as well as parent training. And they find that this particular intervention can improve attention, adaptive abilities, and also reduce both disruptive and behaviors and negative emotions. So here you can see disruptive behaviors before training and after using this GoFAR 
intervention. They also see improvements with what's called face land. This trains individuals on how to recognize facial expressions, whereas you don't see improvement in the controls. And a similar pattern is seen here with negative emotions. There's also the MILE program, which is designed to improve mathematical skills in children with prenatal alcohol exposure. Again, engaging the parents and the families in training children on mathematics and also training them just more about fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. And here you can see improvements in math performance following this training compared to those that did not get training. And this is still evidence six months later. Mary O'Connor has been looking at trying to improve social skills in individuals with prenatal alcohol exposure. And she has a friendship training program that's been shown to improve social skills. So here you can see a before test and the individuals who get this friendship training shown in yellow and controls shown in red, that after the test, there's an improvement in social skills that's still evident months later. Similarly, if they receive the social skills training, this friendship training, there's also a reduction in problem behaviors as well. Heather Carmichael Olson developed a program that was really designed to help improve outcomes for families because it was recognized that families raising children with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders need evidence-based strategies that work to help manage their children's behaviors. They need support from others who understand what they're experiencing. And unfortunately, many families don't get FASD-informed care in their communities because they simply aren't the providers. This Family Moving Forward program has recently been revised to a mobile platform by Christy Petrenko. So they've made some modifications and call this now the Families Moving Forward Connect. Again, it's a mobile health intervention for caregivers raising children with FASD. And so this can improve accessibility to interventions. Here's just an example. You can see some of the components. There are learning modules, notebooks, family forums, and so on. Here again, it's just the interface. The families go through these training modules. And the idea is that this might help us to access families who may not have access to providers in their local communities. So by using mobile health, again, we may be able to not only improve diagnosis and screening, but increase accessibility to interventions as well. And this is currently under development. So in terms of treatments, I think that ultimately what we're going to find is that multiple approaches, educational, behavioral, pharmacological, nutritional, may provide the best treatments for fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. And I think our challenge is really to identify the best approach for individuals with FASD and to minimize the obstacles to getting those treatments. So in summary, what I've shown you today is just a little bit of what we know about prenatal alcohol exposure effects. I've shown you that prenatal alcohol exposure can lead to a range of physical, neuropathological, behavioral, and health outcomes. And that we still face a number of challenges in the field as we try to improve prevention, which I really didn't get into today, identification and diagnosis, and ultimately treatment of individuals with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. So there's a long ways for us to go, but we've learned a lot in the last 50 years, and it's been a pleasure sharing this information with you today. I'd like to thank NIAAA has funded a lot of this work, CDC has funded some of the research, a lot of data I've shown you has come from the Collaborative Initiative on Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorders, all of the contributing researchers, and Jeff Wozniak. Thank you so much.